<laughs> and uh, my, my first one of those was like 74, and by that time he, he was already in it. Uh, and I, I won't say anything more about that except um, uh, one of it starts with the uh, golden <clears throat> down. Yeah, two of them were. Ah, okay. <laughs> I had a connection with this guy uh, with another dirt on him. One time on the table, in a bar that we used to call the Nasty Bay. You remember the Nasty Bay? <laughs> anyway, so, so that's one of them. And then the other is, of course, all the time. And anything that you do with iron and the game of size uh, brings it to mind. It's the all of us, it's the killer with all of us. Um, and then lunar rocks, meteorites, kimberlites, uh, diamonds. Not that anything that tell us about some funky thing that's going to wear on it. Uh, and I was going to say earlier today with uh, Henry Carr, uh, it was it was 50 years ago, half a century ago, that I was in sitting in his class at UMass, uh, <laughs> taking his class in. Uh, over more than 20 cars, we were in the class of in the class of the Steve Shire and a bunch of other guys who I can't remember. We all have a half bar trail up crazy. He's dead. I'm sorry, it's a lot of these guys. You know, it happens. But it's us, right? No, 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 we would have made some adjustments. We would have been like, we would have made sure we were reaching that one. We would have been more to the warrior. Now, a few weeks ago at the uh, GL Congress, I wasn't there, but I saw him give this talk online. He sang a little ditty, but I don't know if you made it out, but somebody made out a ditty to honor John Gurry. And he sang this little ditty. Uh, and I added a uh, a verse to honor Haggard to the song. So you can you can have another verse that glorify yourself the next time you want to do that. I don't know if I'm going to get any oxygen. Oh, uh, like this. Oh, my Haggard, right? Oh, my Arnold, the light. Oh, my Zirconian rich. Pharaoh's window for guys. <laughs> oh, my Allah being object of turpentine, turpentine, magnetite. That's it. Then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to give it up again. Or keep having it in. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who would you like to see? Uh, well, I can see this. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lou, and thanks, Sue, and for the invitation. <clears throat> Once you all to say that all of the minerals that uh, uh, Lou uh, has now attributed are all real minerals, <laughs> except that I, there's one that I will no longer face or address, and I call it mineral H. So that's. Uh, that's a, well, that's how it happened. <laughs> which uh, has now there was only one one locality, and of course, you know, people always ask, you know, oh, it has this mineral named after you. Is it worth anything? <laughs> Ooh, sure, okay. But uh, so now it's been found in I don't know twenty or thirty localities in northwestern Australia by um, Linton Jakes and the group in uh, at the University of. National University of Australia. Yeah. And they're mostly a non uh, or Kibble like related one, but land rocks. Tell us what it is because I forgot. It's um 
it's a it's a bear it's a barium uh, and it has some of my favorite elements in it iron and titanium which you mentioned so it's a barium magnesium iron titanium uh, oxide however uh, not very respectable ratio of of metals to to oxygen it's 16 to 38 so that's and also the the, the entire group which is the magneto plumbite series uh, interesting in itself because lead magneto it's magnetic the magneto plumbite series and um, horsonite is uh, one of them that i i named for example um uh, is uh this is one of the point i wanted to make oh and so the, all, all the minerals in that in that series are characterized by large cations so it's barium potassium calcium uh, strontium and lead five of them down yeah okay so once again thanks for the invitation and great to be back uh, at uh, 2000 meters uh, in a place not very far from where i was born and i say people say oh, you know you have why didn't you have an american accent okay and my rhetorical comment is um i'm a good listener but not a good imitator so I can not Afrikaans prop, okay? And it sits on hard disk, there's no question about it. Yeah. But also yeah, as yeah, that's <laughs> but I also say I, I'll tell you where I was born, but don't laugh, and people usually do, and that is Germiston. Okay, so let me just uh, um Germiston at one point in time, when I was growing up, at least had the largest railway junction in the southern hemisphere. That was its claim to fame. It also had a Carnegie Library. So that was famous. And also I played rugby uh, with the, the brother of uh, a Nobel Prize winner from Germiston High School. And uh, he was from Witz, graduated at the age of what, 16, Lou? Sydney Brenner. Oh, yes. Yeah, Sydney Brenner. So we were told in the years I was in high school that uh, we always pointed this photograph and he would, the principal would say, and uh, with boys high school, boys, I want you to aspire to that man in the Sydney Sydney Brenner, of course. And each year we would do the same thing. We'd point mm -hmm. and by the end we were in the trick and all of the younger men all point to the same photograph. But that was Sydney Brenner, okay. Well, okay, let's get back here. Right, so uh, what I'd like to uh, just uh, briefly summarize of this very unusual, um, a super deep, probably transition zone to the lower mantle, a perovskite bearing xenolith. And I would say right at the outset that uh, as far as I know and had been in contact around the world, that these are the first perovskite bearing xenoliths uh, to be recognized in Kimberlites. Uh, let me just, um, and they're from Liberia, and uh, this is a region uh, infamous for its conflict diamonds or blood diamonds, namely from Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. And the, 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 the perpetrator, uh, uh, Taylor is uh, is now in, in prison for 50 years for um, uh, indiscriminate acts against humanity. And his son uh, is in Britain, but his son is in, in Miami, uh, in Chrome, and uh, apparently as barbarous as his father is or was. And um, when he, he was uh, arrested on immigration uh, violations and um, the, the American government wanted to send him back to Liberia. And um, Salif Johnson said, you caught him, you imprisoned him, you can keep him. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> she refused to accept him back. And so the, anyway, he's in Crone and my Right, so let's, let me just briefly uh, summarize and um, have to be very careful. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, uh, but just this is just a gentle reminder. Right, so one, one thing that happens at, uh, at high temperatures and pressures is that the, the crystallography of minerals change. And in this case, uh, the mineral olivine, uh, and uh, which dominates the, uh, the mantle uh, materials, is that uh, uh, it's essentially condensed. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that. And it goes from uh, being orthorhombic uh, to pseudo-cubic, which is mineral wadsleyite, and then finally to ringwoodite, which is cubic. And then, this is an interesting uh, boundary here. So this represents the transition zone between 410 and 660 kilometers. Uh, but then below that, it decomposes 
to, so you'd all recognize this as being enstatite, but it has the perovskite structure. So it's Q. Uh, this is orthorhombic as a respectable enstatite, plus MgO, which is the mineral periclase. Okay. So this is a, let's try and get our heads around it. So, first of all, there is the structural transformation, uh, and that defines the uh, so called transition zone. Now, it's also interesting that in the 1930s, um, it was the question was asked, okay, we know the difference, and that was the moho, we know the difference between the crust and uh, what little we knew about the mantle is that this is a chemical compositional boundary. Okay, but what was suggested, and that was recognized seismically, what was not known was increasing sophistication in, in seismology is that there were these increases in velocity as one went deeper. And what was suggested then, uh, much to the chagrin and surprise of many, that it wasn't a compositional change, but was a structural change. So that was, and that amazes this amazing paper, 1932, and then followed up in 1936. And the person who really uh, identified that was Ted Greenwood and, uh, and Joe Boyd uh, from the, the Geophysical Lab, I guess both of their cells. Okay, so that's the, that's the point. Okay, so perovskite. Perovskite sensu strictu is C-A-S-T-I-O-3. Here's one of my favorite elements, again, titanium, okay? So it's calcium titan. And it's the perovskite structure that is in, I see all the uh, flying, I've done a lot of flying since I've been here, but also passing, I mean, that's the, the solar panels are, have a perovskite structured material in them. Okay? So there's a huge economic uh, interest and resource in this mineral. Okay, so let's go on to it. Okay, so a very common uh, and globally distributed uh, mineral uh, assemblage, I beg your pardon, is are these guys here, which is uh, um, uh, uh, and once again, uh, if my parents knew about Ilmenite, that would be my middle name. And as uh, Lou <laughs> said earlier, <laughs> and so these are Ilmenite pyroxene integrals, very, very common, uh, both in Liberia monastery. Uh, I was told when I gave this talk, the uh, one of the attendees said, "Oh man, I do you really have a new respect for this guy now. They're using it as a doorstop, <laughs> as big as." As big as that, okay? Whereas, you know, my little guy's only you know, a few centimeters in, in diameter. Anyway, so here are the compositions. Uh, with this, uh, it was a totally respectable uh, clinopyroxene and equally respectable um, uh, ilmenite, except that the chrome, I would like to have had a higher chrome because that would be more of an indicator. Nonetheless, the question is, um, and one of the principles of crystallography and metallurgy is that in order to form a solid solution, now there, there are two words that are uh, as opposed as you might want them, a solid solution, how they hold that, okay? But that's what it is. In order for a solid solution to be accomplished, they have to have the same crystal structure. Now, as a, um, not a scholar, but a, a, someone who's interested in the English language, I use the word same, not similar, okay? The same crystal structure. You can't get further away from ilmenite, which is rhombohedral, to clinopyroxene, that is either uh, orthorhombic or monoclinic, okay? They're, they're, that's as far as you can get. The secondly, the one is you see is perfectly opaque and the other is perfectly translucent. Very different. So the question is, how do these form? Well, the, okay, so let's go, let's go to the theories. X, it appears to be X solution. <clears throat> Not only that, there's a coherent relationship between the ilmenite and the clinopyroxene. It's zero, zero, one, again, one, zero, zero. So there is this, this relationship. But if you, that, that Joe Boyd and a lot of other people have attempted to homogenize these. Ian McGregor was another one. Absolutely no way, Jose. You cannot homogenize it, okay, uh, into a single a single material, right? So it's not a solid solution theory. Eutectic or cotectic has also been suggested from and an, from this type of melt. Graphic, they're graphic, but not lamella. That's the other point. Decomposition of a high 
pressure or temperature garnet or kind of pyroxene. Brilliant idea, once made by Ted Ringwood, the other by Barry Dawson. But the problem is, as people who've worked in ultra high pressure um, areas have found similar integrals, except they're olivine, olivine plus ilmenite, olivine plus titanium magnified, olivine plus uta. And what they point out, correctly so, is that the solubility of titanium is far too low <coughs> in, excuse me, in, in garnet or kind of pyroxene to produce the ilmenite. Okay? So it cannot, as Ted Ringwood and, um, and Barry Dawson suggested, perhaps these were super high, high pressure temperature garnet and clinopyroxene that, but it's not, that's not possible either. Okay. So here are the, uh, the new, uh, and I'll show you in more detail in a moment, but here are the new, the new sample. Uh, and what I, what I find is that um, in all of these, and the scale of the idea is about is one or two microns, but there are these lamellae in the, uh, in the ilmenite, okay? The ilmenite component of which I'll show you. And here it is again, these are much coarser. So what I, what we, what I did was uh, to try and find out exactly what was the original composition here where the light phase is a spinel and the darker phase is ilmenite. Now, the reverse is absolutely super abundant, namely titanomagnetite with ilmenite lamellae. Okay, and people sought Randall and others sought earlier on Buddington, for example, all thought that that was an exolution process. Nay, nay, nay. You cannot, uh, uh, once again, remove it. The only way to do it is to reduce it. And so it was the famous Don Lindsley, uh, fortunate enough, one of my mentors, who demonstrated that in order to produce this integral, it had to be oxidized, okay? Now, the reverse apply applies here. We have a, a spinel in the ilmenite rather than a, an ilmenite plus the spinel. And the only way to produce this then is by subsolid reduction rather than oxidation. Okay. Right. So here are the uh, the full samples uh, from uh, from Liberia. I've not included the. So I've referred to these. Uh, the type one is the ilmenite clinopyroxene integral, and uh, these are as you see from the scale. I mean, they're not very big. So these are in polished amounts, and the green material here is olivine, and the darker spots. Uh, are either ilmenite in three of them, and in this one is spinel. Okay, so we have a close um, association then: an oxide plus a silicate, number one. Uh, secondly, uh, um, an oxide plus a silicate of diverse both compositions and crustal the crustal structure. Now the other, I mean, so that was the first uh, attraction in the field as it saw the difference on. Cutting polish and polishing thin section, here was the other big surprise. Is this euhedral, absolutely magnificent, in some cases clear crystals, in other cases saturated with olivine. But look at this mother here. Look at that. In, uh, this is the, um, I mean, that's the field of view. But these, this is a perovskite. Okay. And then uh, in, so I call these are uh, type, type two. And then, so this is, um, uh, uh, perovskite plus uh, ilmenite plus olivine. The host is olivine, and here the host is um, uh, is perovskite. It's olivine plus spinel plus perovskite. Now the other thing that becomes important in in in, in trying to interpret uh, the origin of these is this brown goop here, and this is the mineral monticella. And monticella uh, adds this to your um, your olivine vocabulary is the calcium analog of phosphorite and phthalo. Okay, but it's a messy guy and it's metasomatic. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> but it's in that ilk. Okay, so another really interesting feature is that um, say so here's the perovskite crystal on closer look. Now, by golly, look at the and these dark ma little mothers here. These are all olivine, but even more interesting, the shiny guys here are worcestite, F-E-O. So this immediately tells you, ladies and gentlemen, this is a low, low, low oxidation environment in order for uh, the worcestite indeed to survive. Okay, so here we, 
Here we see it again, and this should be further up there. But these, all of the yellow in here is, is iron in the, in the olive. So now let's look at the olive. Okay, now the question is, is that a breakdown product? And in fact, we've demonstrated this in the laboratory. Uh, I wrote a paper many years ago with Ian Baker. Um, in fact, it's graduate students. Uh, is that the olivine breaks down, and we demonstrated in um, magnetic studies that that is a source of magnetism in the in the in, in lavas. Okay, but here and so so now the question is: Are these inclusions? Did the did the wustite form after it? Uh, or, or what was the what was the situation? Anyway, so the other thing I did was to do a bulk chemistry on these. I mean, using my using the SEM, and uh, here uh, here is an average uh, value here: the perovskite plus olivine, taking fifty five to forty five. Uh, oh, quite not bad. Uh, calcium looks good. Uh, yeah, you can argue for that. You know, that's not bad. And here's uh, ideal uh, perovskite plus olivine. Uh, 29, uh, too, much too high magnesium, but calcium is good, um, silica is not bad, and uh, titanium is not better. When you reduce this then as CATIO3 plus uh, uh, phosphorite, this is the formula you get. And uh, all I want you to remember at the moment is that it's a, it's a, there's a metal silica plus oxygen seven, okay? Now in the subsequent plots, We'll plot the magnesium number versus titanium. But this is the thing to remember is oxygen seven. Right. In taking a closer look now, so that's one category in which the perovskite is not always, but some most good, is saturated with olivine plus phosphate. In other cases, look at this beautiful uh, shape here, and now it's uh, partially uh, replaced by the gunk, uh, namely uh, uh, the uh, the calcium olivine, but here's the perovskite, and here is spinel. These are the white phase here, as well as in here. So once again, bulk compositions using the uh, uh, electron microscope is another example of. It. Anyway, once again, to cut a long story short, here, look at this. It's a calcium, iron, titanium, oxygen seven. Okay. And so there is clearly a commonality or common factor um, comp uh, in terms of bulk composition of what, the, what this was before it became, I'm going to use the word very carefully, unmixed. I'm not going to use X solution, but unmixed. Okay? And uh, once again, please be careful uh, in using uh, the, uh, the word X solution. Um, just think about it. So it's a solid and solution. You know, those, uh, it's a paradox, okay, to say the least. Okay, so the other feature, which I, I mean, keep pointing about in the crystallography, is that this is not only atypical, it's unusual, not unique, unusual that magnetite is cubic. Absolutely no other way, okay? And it turns out that these compositions are, in fact, very close to magnetite composition. FeTiO3 with a little bit of titanium and a little bit of magnesium, I beg your pardon. But otherwise, but the important point is it's non cubic spinel lamellae in perovskite. What we do know is that the transformation spinel, <laughs> a very respectable mineral, okay, had, will change from cubic to orthorhombic between 15 and 25 GPA at quite a modest temperature, 12, maybe 1300 degrees. So there is this structural transformation as a function, once again, of, of pressure, as we pointed out, for olivine going ultimately to Wadsleyite, then Ringwoodite, and then eventually breaking down. So what I'm suggesting here, perhaps, perhaps, is that we're looking at the reverse, then, of a two-phase component that ultimately, on lower pressure, will homogenize the unmixing will be reversed, and that is the way that the, that, that that's how this resulted. So here's um, here are these uh, magnetite, <laughs> strange bedfellows, magnetite looking like uh, an orthorhombic on high heels. Okay, yeah. come on, let's be respectable. But look at this: the end member chornerite has just been described. It has the the, the solid solution. 
uh, for um, uh, this is Olga Spinel, and in an titanium oxide diagram, the solid solution would be between magnetite and Olga Spinel and ilmenite and hematite. But here we're looking at um, an, a, 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 an iron calcium titanium diagram. Okay. So in, uh, in the first Kimberlite conference in Cape Town, I reported uh, this single phase here uh, from the uh, Kimberlite uh, cow uh, in, um, in, in, uh, in the Sutu. And it was clearly, it's a, it's a solid solution between ilmenite and perovskite. Now note, uh, this is a, these have exactly, uh, that can be osterombic or cubic. And this is therefore a true solid solution line. Now, what was unexpected is that these bulk compositions in recalculating it, look at this, that's the star, falls exactly on the ilmenite FEO line, okay? So that was a big surprise. I couldn't imagine that it's right, it's precisely on that line. Here, secondly, oxygen O7, okay, on, uh, on this joint. Now, what's one possibility then is that this calcium, which is the bulk composition, if you recall, Oxygen seven on on reduction goes from here to the bulk compositions that you see here. Secondly, here's another possibility of so this has been produced synthetically in experiment that it was that mineral that gave rise to this uh, to this assembly. But here's the even more an interesting feature. So just uh, last year, uh, folks at Caltech, including John Beckett, one of my former students now found this mineral, look at the shape of this, and it is 80 to 90% of a spinel. In other words, it's the opposite end member of magnetite, which is this guy here. Now, I don't, the, um, this is being x-rayed now to make, to, to ensure that it is not, but the other point, you know, it's, it's also its own. But look at the similarity. These are, these are also, this is also rhombic, and I'm convinced that this is also rhombic as well. So in other words, the, oh, and um, the estimate, I beg your pardon, not only that, it's uh, one of Lou's um, favorite uh, meteoritic groups because he was among the first to suggest that the, the, the meet, some meteorites that we have landed on Earth are not just from the, from the asteroidal belt, but were from Mars. And there's the man who first described that, correct? Right. <laughs> there was very little belief, but what was the evidence? The evidence was on the gas, uh, rare gases in part that were previously been obtained on the Viking missions. And so that's what these guys put together at NASA. And now we have a whole slew of them, ones that have been found in the Antarctic and in, uh, in the Sahara. And uh, this is one of them. So it's a Shigotti uh, meteorite from Mars. Shock, and the estimate is uh, probably greater than 20 GPA. We call here, as the transformation is between 15 and 24. So things are really looking, coming together uh, in terms of the, the higher uh, uh, proposed uh, uh, pressure. Okay, so let's now, there are two important uh, and recent studies, uh, one by um, Matrasova in 2020, and the other one is by Armstrong, which I'll show momentarily. Two very important papers that are in the, uh, in uh, the, the crux and the basis now for a deeper understanding of mantle, deep mantle petrology. Okay, okay. So let's go to the first one. Ah, oh, here's very here's our answer side again, and it's with the mineral dekelite. So this is the magnesium analog of ilmenite, and there's another one which is escalite, uh, Cr two O three, and hematite. They're all isostructure. But here now we have this the type the a titanium and opaque uh, together with the silicate. So the point I want to make here then is that this diagram, in fact, is a proxy for the type one ilmenite plus uh, a pyroxene and or the type two and three, which are pyroxene plus olivine or spinel plus olivine. Now you might say, yeah, wait, 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 wait. It's a pyroxene versus olivine. Let's not forget about Bowen's reaction series. How does that work? It's olivine, pyroxene, and then uh, amphibole, micro, and so on. Yeah, the only difference is, is silica. And uh, in the case of the, of the titanium content, it's titanium versus uh, the, uh, the silica. So in other words, 
the, the, the question is why did these authors select titanium versus silica? Here's the answer. Uh, between a mem one end member that is silica and the other end member is titanium. But the common one is magnesium. They cut magnesium out of it. And it's not a case, please, ladies and gentlemen, of plotting geraniums against germanium. Nay, nay, nay. There has to be a reason for it, okay? You just cannot indiscriminately plot X against Y unless you have a good, solid, crystallographic or geochemical reason. And here it is here. It's embraced in the simple formula of these two elements. Okay. Well, let's, let's look at this. Remember the 07 guy? So partial a de a decompression path for the bulk composition of perovskite with olivine inclusion gives this, okay? And here are the, uh, these uh, dashed lines then indicate uh, an ideal one plus one and or what are actually measured in the, in the sample. Okay, so bulk composition of peroxide here, once again, 07, very interesting, right? The precursor, and the precursors are, have been suggested that these were titanium bridgmanite. What the hell is bridgmanite? It's the super high pressure analog of, remember the breakdown at the, the transition zone? You take that even further, it breaks down into um, uh, MgSiO3, plus MGO, the perovskite. That MGSIO3, which under normal uh, shop and stop uh, 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 shelf would be called Enstite, okay? You put it in on the top shelf, uh, the most expensive part, it's Bridgmanite. Now, Bridgmanite has not been, I repeat, not been recognized as a diamond inclusion, but experimentally is in the diamonds, well into the diamond stability field, and is of lower mantle pressure and temperature. Uh, stability, no question about it. What we do, rec what is recognized is the decomposition once again of the Bridgmanite into MgSiO3 plus MgO. Okay. So the pre, so one suggestion then is that the precursor was a titanium uh, enriched uh, Bridgmanite uh, greater than 20 GPA. Was paths that included Wadsleyite, remember the, the lower uh, pressure form of Ringwoodite, and the mineral Weberite. Weberite, never heard of it. Here it is, MGTI SI207. Rather unusual mineral, but here it appears repeatedly. And so what I say, please note, is the metal to oxygen ratio of five to seven. Right, so we start off somewhere up here for type one, two, and three xenolis. And then uh, with decompression, decompression, cooling, we go through, uh, this is a magnesium rich uh, bridge line. Uh, there's Wadsleyite, the Weberite, okay? Now we also get Rutil. We don't, I've not seen Rutil here, but I wouldn't be surprised uh, to, uh, to find it. So what, what, I, what I'm suggesting now then is that this diagram is in fact a proxy for what we see naturally. And it's a very simple plot of um, a titanium versus uh, titanium plus silica. And as this is as a function of pressure, okay? So this, so the, and it's at 1600 degrees uh, centigrade. Okay, so let's have a look at the next one. Okay, now this was the real breakthrough of this paper by Armstrong and uh, with uh, the, the new director of the, the geophysical laboratory. Um, this classic paper, as far as I'm concerned, in Journal of Petrology. Right, so here, here are two examples then of once the, the type one, uh, which is clinopyroxene plus uh, ilmenite. I don't want to belabor the point. You, I think you've got the message. Different crystallography, different chemistry, but there is this internal textual coherence. And this is what we see in the new samples from Liberia that also include um, uh, 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 the, the perovskite. Now, what Armstrong and Matroska showed previously, so here's a diagram now, now we have titanium, once again, titanium is titanium number versus magnesium number. The last diagram, if you recall, was the titanium number versus pressure. In the system, MGO, CAO, TiO2, SiO2, what they show is a whole series of solvi. Now remember, if you would, that you take two N members um, from a solid solution series, and the central part of it then is a solvent in which the two minerals will progressively break down 
with decompress decomp or, or, or cooling. These are then, these are cell by, okay? So uh, let's just go straight to, so what they showed initially was these are a whole major uh, compositional, uh, uh, co uh, comp comp compilation of, it, of data that included uh, work by um, our souls at UMass, but also by John Gurney. And the suggestion is that this uh, very common one will probably fell or falls, I beg your pardon, in the solvite at about 55 GPA. Now that is super high pressure. And uh, there was, there's a lot of discussion as to whether that has any meaning uh, at all. Now you recall in the Liberian samples, uh, there is, is all this uh, um, calcium juncture, which is metasomatic. So what I did was Mike Rhodes, in fact, uh, Lou and Sue, um, uh, did XRF on these, and these are the XRF results. XRF there, and uh, the red here, and the red here. In the, uh, this uh, is now this, this magic uh, and beautiful program we always wrestled by Kelvin previously, is doing mineral modal recombination. And the thing too that becomes important in that, you do uh, point counting hundreds and hundreds of times, different areas, different techniques, but you get the proportion of the, the mineral under the microscope, you then get the composition of each of the minerals, and then you combine them. But one, the secret ingredient of success is density. And when you look at the data, you look at the literature, there's no mention of density. In it. But anyway, there is this, this program called Rock Maker, and it's essentially a mineral modal recombination. Uh, uh, um, program okay and does a great job and we put it to tests and it really worked okay so the xrf data then uh, the hole is here and but it includes the monticella in the when doing the modal uh, uh, mineral modal uh, recombination mechanism this is where they end up so the xrf data is here and of course it includes, this excludes the, um, the calcium gunk, and so does that. And these now lie, the type two and type three, in what I think we would uh, say among geological close friends is a more reasonable uh, pressure, it's still super high, but certainly more reasonable. So my final conclusion then is that uh, this is possible, uh, but I think this is much more realistic. These are, there's no, there's no alteration or replacement uh, in these. So the XRF data uh, gives, um, it gives, the same, gives the same result, which is here. Uh, this is the motor recombination. That's the XRF data, okay? Very close. So, so we have some confidence then that um, removal of the, of the metasomatic component is in fact, it's not a fiction, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reality. Okay, so in conclusion then, the type 1 zinnus, although falling within the 55 uh, GPA solvus in that system, CPX and l are probably more likely a perovskite structured, but true X solution is still not possible, please, because the titanium solubility in whether it's a high-pressure garnet or kind of is minimal. Proposed that the, the CPX amount is decomposed and iron titanium bridgmanite. Now, this has not been a fully established experiment. The perovskite gives its uh, sense of strictive formula. Calcium titanate is present as diamond inclusions. Perovskite itself is stable up to 60 GPA and is present in this, the first report of perovskite in mantle xenolus and is indicative, in my view, of super deep origin. The olivine plus perovskite, the type 2, and spinel plus perovskite, type 3 bulk composition, reduced to M, the O7 five to seven ratio of compound, which is equivalent to Weberite, that is stable between 15 and 20 GPA. The type two and three bulk compositions more realistically lie, in my view, in 35 GPA. But with continued decompression, uh, will fall into the 15 to 20. So in other words, they're in the transition. And equilibrium estimates are consistent with the transformation spinel from cubic to zorambic, that looks good. And although the solvus origins of type 1 and type 2 and 3 of them over 1,000 kilometers, equilibration at 450 to 600 
in the barrier melange of the transition zone. Why call it a melange? Because it's subduct materials, there are plume materials, and it's a, it's a hodgepodge, okay? It's really quite surprising, at least to me, that the seismic data you know, really define those boundaries, but there are all sorts of irregularities in the, in the transition zone. So I thank you for your attention, and that's my conclusion. Was it? Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Makes There's two. One is that the rock has a very common number of as and it's typically it's around the whole nine hundred and fifty, and that's it. It doesn't break down. Secondly, I think that it's uh, possibly the, the speed with which we know that there have been holes in, in, in the passage of the like that. But I think it's the the last bit that 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 the and then you think that the Kimberley comes from the steep, wouldn't it have been the two-stage mantle convection and then later the eruption? Well, that's possible too. But I think the when we look at the first question, what was the proto Kimberley now? And I think the closest we can get to this is the micro in terms of composition. Secondly, that it is in my view it's extremely from the form that the down. Why do we say that? Because the large, uh, now the, the type 2 diamond has metal. And when we find metal uh, in the earth, the coal, then the other place, as you mentioned, the space mine, you know, that very down, and give drive to iron nickel, or nickel total, what are we going to do? Isn't there a uh, <coughs> titanium CPX? Yes. Uh, of course, titanium, like right. But it has a low pressure. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. 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 What is the deepest yeah. inclusion or piece of material we have that we can quantify and say it's going to certain day? How, how deep are these relative to the deepest inclusion? Mm -hmm. the very good question. As time so, where we have and numerous diamonds and localities from the transit for changes. And and no, it's like the question the lower man. Yeah, in the lower, what was in I was just before you that written by third say has not been written. But what is written, T5 that we can't get in third place, is NPSIMC plus India. And this is broad strength pressure and this is very good. So, getting them back close, and then the, the critical experiment, well, no, we have to break something and then it makes. What is not being demonstrated is if you do that, that this will make it really. So, we don't really have anything in its, its original mineral form from lower than transition zone. We have a breakdown product, but not a breakdown product for the choking source. And I think the evidence is so wrong. Also, because it's pretty hard, but it's not common. But in terms of all of these diamonds, it is the fan can and the arena, the example of the same country. So, then it's a financial question. Is that uh, at least in the lower end? Um, you know, that you would not get that combination in the first. You would not get that combination in the first. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying to think of the deep you know, like, I don't know if they have specific data that the strains of the That's true. All you can say is that you can say it's as in like 2000. How fast, or any idea how how fast the phase becomes transformation happens? So a high pressure phase becoming stable at lower pressure, and how do you sort of couple that with the idea that candle lights come up very quickly, um, geologically speaking? What I think is that I use the word barrier. That barrier would be another term in the transition, and uh, so we. But it also provides some features in the macrolides that have invisible carbonate, invisible matrix in the And so, what you suggested was that the transition zone is one of these barriers, and I call it the melange of the subtractions. The other thing we know is that the question is do these slabs go all the way down to the corner? And that's the debate. What we do know is that many of them slide out and make it up for you. And particularly, the paper is on this um, slab um, subduction uh, um, there. I mean, they go into hibernation. Now, what other people have shown is that, I'll take a read, is that this would break through and you might have log getting through. But there's a point I want to make. Is that the transition zone then is also a transition zone in terms of the velocity of the figure? We come back to a fluid wanting a big spirit, and it's a motion of spirit out at the fourth or the second line. As it goes through, the same thing happens to the fourth or the tenth. So, yeah, I should think that people are coming from the Absolutely, the prior and not the city. So this is all on base one. I mean, so in your prediction that the time scale will really be short. Yeah, okay. So it's happening during the rush. And and you see you have kind of things you could taste like diffusion diffusion gradient. So you know, well the time scale that short, but you know, that's that you know, like you said, you know, it's like homogenized. In the transition zone, or it's just like a um, it's like snapshots of a um, but in the range of the question, I think I would just think what the better quality by the name of the answer we get to the dead point here. The question of slow time, yeah, and if we take the better confusion of the day, is that the most and that that is the evidence to get us you know, in the book of the I think it's right. Yeah, I think I think so too. Because you maybe there's some of the confusions in different growth zones that we have different positions and maybe we must talk to the pair with this um age So the reason for the one to know the distinguish between the diamond probably the answer last week from my age of brush. And so we know that if we that the birds of heaven might be separated out in the living person that the spirit is going to be involved in that and that's that's the critical feature to differentiate down from that's what we put in the years of all of you and natural life. That's what it's based on. Okay, so we know that in addition to that. Also, an experiment hydrogen with the food rate extremely slow in down. Hydrogen is the nitrogen is the very slow. So, we have to be more than that. So, it's a change in density or a change in volume of these transformations. Is that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the type of thing. It's an increase in density and an increase in size of the rocket. But, but are you seeing that in the crystal structure? The, the oh, I, in, in, yeah. I don't know. 
But one thing that, uh, that I think contact with people about is that if this model is correct, then we should be all of you. Uh, my question is, can you see a precursor to the other stuff? What's what there and really is there any memory that's still locked up in the other? I don't know, I don't know the answer. Now, in the case of the magnet, I think it's now you can get on the clock and anything else, but the possibility of this type of pitch back from the board is also on the base from the filament of the seeds that the dead rate, and then the comparison is to both the mutual. I have one more quick question. Um, but this is, uh, am I uh, a diamond? Uh, I think I was. Uh, is follow the paper this is that you can find diamonds that there's diamonds spread like in the low mental yeah. transition zone in the upper mental period? Okay. I would say that one. It's not sound. Okay. To me, it implies a bit more. It's really important to make that <laughs> the gentleman one. That at one point in time, carbon still to be the postmodern quantum problem in solid. It is now established that the postmodern quantum can be used. So carbon is carbon. The other interesting point which is related to the relative zone or the future is the question. As the as the, the diamond in the two lines of the the direct right is the direct order, and when they held in some position of the truth, provided the question, provided the description of how the surrounding us, will the diamond continue to grow? And the answer experimentally is yes, because the diamond is a speed and it's actually in the tight in the two direct order. And that's the whole process. Of chemical wave of evolution. You can be attracted to the season and then it's quite a temperature and super active in the chemical. And with those that are some disbelief in the world community, they try to not have a piece of textbook tradition. But the game is still a bit. And here I have in the general audience to be working. I think it's a good resident. No, 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 no. They will have a good idea. But look what happened uh, just the last year 555 carats for 55 pounds of money, sold for $4.3 million on auction, et cetera. The two patterns that they started. You know, you know what was basically the thing that they Number one, yeah. it's what? It's what? It's no, I've got one. The, the two main points that I have the part of the when that the same. The two factors are it's the largest cap diamond. Now, to you know, they don't it's polycrystal, it comes in the time that the, the same thing, it's an exit to the other one. Where the hell did they get that? And that's that from the New York Times in the 1970s. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Here's all the value next to the four guests. this one is from Bahia, and um, 
I did some yeah. X-ray tomography on this. Mm -hmm. and I, we think we found the largest pre-solar inclusion in a carbon atom, one cubic millimeter across. We don't know the composition. You know what I did? It's, it's inside. You can see what I think. Yeah. I'm taking a knife on Osborne. Okay. But it seems to have been maybe radioactive. I'll show you. Wow. <laughs> so you're a believer now. 